Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Zechariah chapter number 4 tonight. Look at Zechariah chapter number 4. You ever had a period of time when you had to live without power? I remember going through an ice storm when I was a kid in Brunswick, Georgia. That was my first experience of it. I don't remember how many days we were without, but I know it was more than one. And uh, I remember how difficult it was to trying to do things without power. My wife and I have experienced extended power outages from ice storms both in Tennessee and Indiana. <clears throat> I think we've been through um, several there, three, three days each time we were without power. And I can tell you from experience that that was too long. <laughs> okay. There was people that had to go through it longer than we did, and we were thankful that we got it back in three days. But three days is a long time to, to live without power, especially when it's cold. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that we got any, anybody old enough to remember the time whenever uh, <clears throat> electricity first came to your part of the country or not. But if you do, you remember what life was like before light bulbs and electric refrigerators and air conditioners. I had some... My grandparents on my dad's side kind of lived primitively uh, in Dothan, Alabama for a while. I remember early on when we used to go, they didn't have electricity. They had, we, we had the kerosene lamps that we were dealing with then. I don't, somewhere along the way, they got electricity, but they didn't have indoor plumbing. Um, I, 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 I kind of, I'm kind of fond of my indoor plumbing and uh, my electricity, but... Uh, you hear people say, you know, I don't think I could live, I could make it without my air conditioner. And those folks would say, oh yeah, you could. And that's because they've lived for a time without electrical power when there was none. And yes, one can live without power. And the Amish choose to live that way. But why would someone want to live without power when power is available? That's my question, right? Um, some believers seem to live powerless lives. They have electricity in their homes, they drive gas-powered cars, but they seem to live with no spiritual power from God working in their life. They live as if they have no power to resist temptation, no power to defeat worry or discouragement, no power to face the hard challenges of life. Instead of God's strength, they feel their own weakness. Instead of enjoying victory, they seem hopelessly defeated. There's no way, to, no way to live. The Bible says that if Jesus Christ lives in you, all of heaven's power is available uh, to you. But you have to put that power to work. Tonight in Zechariah 4, I want to help us all to do that. I want to show three truths about how we put God's power to work in our life. And the message from Zechariah 4 is power for God's work. Power for God's work. And the first thing I want us to see tonight is God's power comes by His Spirit. God's power comes by His Spirit. Look at uh, verse number 1. And let's read the first six verses here. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked to me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold, with a, a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, <clears throat> and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I, and I said, no, Lord, no, my Lord. And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This is the prophet's fifth vision from God uh, to the uh, Jewish exiles rebuilding the temple. This one is mainly addressed to Zerubbabel. 
the, their ruler. He was the, called a governor. <clears throat> Remember the last vision was for Joshua, the high priest. Remember that? And God tells Zerubbabel here that the power that he needs in order to do this work of rebuilding the temple only comes from God's Spirit. After having received the first four visions, think about um, all of these visions came in one night. <clears throat> That's a pretty, pretty full night. Amen. Uh, after the first four visions from God, apparently Zechariah did like what we do. Some of us do it this in church. We drift off to sleep. <laughs> uh, but um, the angel waked him up and, and asked him, What seest thou? And he responds there in verse 2, saying that he sees a candlestick of solid gold, its seven branches are fed with oil from a bowl at the top, which apparently is fed by two olive trees on either side of the candlestick. And this reminds him of the golden candlestick, the Hebrew menorah, that stood in the tabernacle and in the original temple. Now that's what Zechariah sees, <clears throat> but he's not sure what it means. So he asked the angel who seems to think that Zechariah already knows the answer, but he explains it all to him there in verse 6. He answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, there's numer numerous speculations that have been made about the interpretation. Most of them that you read don't agree. Some say the angel doesn't really interpret the vision. Others say you have to skip some verses before he actually explains what Zechariah sees. Now, I don't claim to be a Hebrew scholar, but I believe the key to understanding this vision is related to the context of the prophecy. Uh, one of the things we're going to study on our Wednesday night, in our Wednesday night studies as we're looking at biblical interpretation we're going to see where context reigns is a very important thing and it reigns supreme. Now, first of all, we must remember that this message is addressed to Zerubbabel, the governor, the leader of the Jewish exiles. This prophecy had both a present aspect of fulfillment as well as a future aspect. Now, that's, some, that's something that uh, a lot of folks have a trouble grasping sometimes, that prophecy, a lot of prophecy is this way. It had a, an immediate fulfillment, but it had, also had a much later fulfillment that he was looking at. First, God wants to encourage Zerubbabel as he leads these people in rebuilding the temple. They had been thwarted time and time again in their efforts to build the temple. So God tells him this work cannot be done by mere human strength, power, or prowess. Uh, he, will, he would need God's power to do this work. And that means that he will need God's Spirit. Um, we know that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And understand that God's power by God's Spirit is necessary to successfully do anything for God. And, oh, yeah, you can work in the flesh, but you're not going to accomplish much. Uh, you've got to have the Spirit of God. Now fast forward to our day. Think about Israel in its present situation. Israel is building a state based on the strength of politics negotiations, and military power. But we know that these things will not lead to their goal of being reestablished peacefully in the land of Israel with their original borders intact. Israel bears witness to Bible prophecy fulfillment. When the Jewish state was reestablished back in 1948, it instituted the golden candlestick, the menorah, with an olive branch on either side of as its emblem. If you look at the Jewish flag, you'll see that. Also, standing in front of the Knesset, which is the political parliament and the seat of Israel's government, is a great seven-armed candlestick, again, a menorah, engraved with the, the words that we find right here 
in Zechariah 4 and verse number 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this is an unconscious but prophetic sign that Israel is being drawn nearer to the fulfillment of the last of the, of the biblical prophecies. While presently Israel's focus is primarily directed on politics, power, and her armed forces, the, the focus of the Lord of hosts is only on the Messiah. Israel's future, her, is, uh, her righteousness, her, her peace under the Lord, Lordship of the Messiah, and the final new temple can never come about by military force, but it's only going to come about by God's Spirit. And... Some say the candlestick represents the temple. Some say the candlestick represents Messiah. Well, since the temple represents the dwelling place of the Lord, both are true. Okay, um, temp Temple, uh, Messiah, the, 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 the temple pictured the, the Messiah anyway. So, the oil of the candlestick is a familiar biblical symbol of the Holy Spirit. Since the candlestick represents the Lord, the priests were to make sure that it was always burning because the Lord's Spirit is always working. Amen. Always available. And what the angel uh, is saying to Zerubbabel is this. Just as the lamp must have oil flowing in it to shine its light, you must have my spirit if you want my power working in your life. We need to grab a hold of that, amen, uh, ourselves. We can only have God's power by His Spirit. I mean, Jesus even told His disciples before He ascended, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, to have God's power means you have the Spirit of God working in your life. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you receive the Spirit. That happens when you get saved. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in. We studied that when we were in the book of Romans. Romans 8 and 9, that you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, not if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit already lives in you. You don't have to pray Him in. You don't have to beg Him to come in. He's already there. His power is already in you. He wants to work in you, through you. But in order for that to happen, guess what? you got to be filled with the Spirit. That's Ephesians 5.18, but be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. If you've ever seen somebody that was filled with alcohol, they were controlled by the alcohol. And, and that he compared, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's the same way a drunk man is controlled by the alcohol, we're to be controlled by the Spirit. Uh, but we're not to be drunk, amen. That's not what he's talking about. Um, being filled with the Spirit does not mean that we uh, do weird things or follow our holy hunches or anything like that. While it's true the Spirit does lead us in many ways, we must always be careful. It's very easy to dress up our own desires as the leading of the Spirit, but when we are led by the Spirit, that's when the Spirit of God works in our life. Now, the question tonight is, does God's Spirit live in you? Then if He does, if you're saved tonight, He does. And God's power also lives in you. You're led by the Spirit of God. If you, if you are led by His Spirit, that's the difference between having God's power working in you and living a powerless life. The key is to be filled with the Spirit, allow His Spirit to, to, uh, to lead you. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we don't have to wait to access God's power. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> a story told many years ago, a man who lived <clears throat> far out in the country like my grandparents decided to get power connected to his home. And on the day the power company came and hooked the wires from the pole to his house, a friend came to see the man, asked him why he hadn't turned on the lights. He said, well, I want to make sure that give the electricity plenty of time to get here from uptown. You know? And um, 
You know, that, we don't have to be that way, thank God, with His power. If we're saved and His Spirit lives in us now, we've got the power. All we must do is use it. And with all the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life, what can we do? If we, well, there's nothing is impossible, is there? Uh, no task is too large or too small for God's power. Look at the verses 7 through 10. That's the next thing I want you to see. No task is too large or too small for God's power. Verse 7, <clears throat> Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Uh, thou shalt become a plain. Okay. In other words, that, that mountain's going to be flat. That's what that's talking about. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, uh, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this, of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now, get this. No task is too large or too small for God's power. Different work requires different amounts of power. We know that. We've got some things in our house that run on uh, 120 volts. We've got other things that run off of 220 volts. And uh, if you want to, we know that if you want to tow a canoe, you could probably do it with most any vehicle. But if you want to tow a fifth wheel motorhome, you're going to have to have something that's got a lot of power. Amen? You'll have to need a lot more horsepower than the average vehicle has. Different things require different amounts of power. Different work requires uh, different amounts of power. But the, the beautiful thing about God's power is that He is omnipotent. Amen? Nothing's, nothing's too hard for Him. Um, God can handle it all. And no task is too big or too small for Him. <clears throat> God's power can handle big tasks. Uh, Zerubbabel and his friends face some mountain-sized problems. We read that there in verse number 7. And while they were rebuilding the temple, there were some things that uh, they just could not overcome themselves. In Zerubbabel's day, just like today, <clears throat> Israel was surrounded by many enemies, and each one of those enemies were bent on Israel's destruction. And uh, there were also, no doubt, the usual complainers and naysayers, even among the builders themselves. It was not easy, and I'm sure uh, there had to be, had been times when Zerubbabel just felt like giving up. Don't you imagine? I mean, the work wasn't getting done some of the time. And that's why God spoke to the mountains threatening to defeat Zerubbabel there in verse number 7. He was going to flatten them. Now verse 9 says that Zerubbabel started the job and would finish the job. God was going to see to it. Now, that would prove that God had sent His word through Zechariah. No mountain would stand in the way because no task is too big for God's power. God's power can handle big tasks, but God's power can also handle small things and even make great things out of the small, can He? He can. Um, uh, he said that you, for that first part of the verse 10, for who hath despised the day of small things? And I understand there were some who had. I want you to flip back a few pages to the little book of Haggai. These were written about the same time. Uh, and, and address some of the same issues. Uh, uh, of course, Zechariah handles a lot more, but Haggai was he was uh, concerned about the uh, the uh, building rebuilding of the temple as well, and why it had not been rebuilt. <clears throat> and uh, Haggai two, Haggai two, ver look at verse number three through verse number nine. Verse number three. And he asked a question here, Who is left among you that saw this house, talking about the temple, 
in her first glory. And we're talking about Solomon's temple, right? Remember that being a glorious temple? Those of you that were with us on Wednesday night when we saw uh, Solomon build the temple and the glory that was there was just a great, a great thing. He says, how do you see it now? <clears throat> They're looking at this temple and he said, is it not, is it not in your eyes uh, in comparison of it as nothing? They were they had a small idea. They said, With this, it's not going to be anything like Solomon's temple. It wasn't Solomon's temple, but it was the temple that the Lord wanted them to build. Okay, and uh, look, look at verse number four. <clears throat> Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. There's the, there's the governor, said the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And, and that gets back to, they weren't going to be able to do it by themselves. Spirit of God, they had to, they had to obey the Lord and do what God told them to do. And He would help them in the task of what He set them there to do. Verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house, notice this, the glory of this latter house, the temple they were building, shall be greater than of the former. Talking about Solomon's temple that he built. The glory of this one is going to be greater than the glory of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And so there were some who were kind of, uh, the reason they wouldn't, Zerubbabel wouldn't get much out of them, as they were saying, who wants to bother with this little thing? Who wants to bother? I mean, this is not going to be anything like uh, Solomon's temple. Why, why are we even bothering? Now, understand that seven is the number of perfection, and the seven eyes of the Lord that uh, mentioned there in Zechariah 4 that we just read, <clears throat> this, those seven eyes there in verse number 10, uh, uh, represent his omniscience, his his all seeing and his all knowingness. God would have Zerubbabel finish the work. The Lord who sees everything sees Zerubbabel with the plumb line, putting the finishing touches on the temple. And those that didn't think that it would happen or that it would amount to anything, guess what? they'll wind up rejoicing. That's what he said there. For they shall rejoice. There in verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So this job that seemed so small and insignificant had a big place in God's plans. Think about this. Many would come to worship God there in that temple. Many would come to remember how God kept His promise and brought His people back home. They've been in, in captivity for 70 years in uh, Babylon. But He brought them back just like He said He would. Uh, and most importantly, the Messiah Himself would adorn this temple by His very presence in the flesh. This small thing, as some called it, would have a big impact in God's scheme of things. God's power and presence can show up in even the smallest things. How does God's power need to work in your life? Maybe it's a big task. Changing somebody's heart, repairing a relationship, healing a hurt, 
coming up with money just to pay your bills. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe it's a big task like that, or maybe it's even a small task motivating you to pray more, to come to church more faithfully, or helping you to be more merciful or forgiving when it comes to other folks. Ever how we need God's power to work in our lives. We need to remember this. No task is too big for Him, and no task is too small for Him to notice. God's power working through His Spirit is always enough to handle whatever our need or whatever our problem may be. So what task do you need God's power to handle tonight in your life? Don't be afraid to bring it to Him. His power is always enough to do whatever He needs uh, to be done. So we've seen God's power comes by His Spirit. We've seen no task is too, too large or too small for God's power. Last fall, we see God's power works through His people. Look at verse 11 through 14. God's power works through His people. Verse 11, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which uh, through uh, the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Power has to be channeled in order to do any good. <clears throat> the electric power we're enjoying in here right now. <laughs> I don't know a lot about it. I go over there and flip the switch on and I know it works, all right? Either it works or it don't. Uh, depending on whether the, 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 the lights are on, whether the electricity's still running. There's sometimes you'll come over here and the electricity will be off and they won't work. But I, I flip the switch, that's about all I know of, of electricity. But electrical power is channeled through wires to a transformer on a pole and then through the transformer to the wires in your home. And the wiring in, in, is the channel, the conduit, is the instrument through which the power flows. God's power, by His Spirit, also uses a conduit, a channel, an instrument through which His power flows. You know what that is? That's us. Amen? It's us. <clears throat> his Spirit and His power to work through His people. That is the point of what we just read there in verses 11 through 14. Zechariah is still curious about the two olive trees, and so he questions his angelic host, who again seems to think that Zechariah should already know. But he goes on to explain there in verse number 14, <clears throat> Now let's think about the context again. People were anointed in Israel to set them apart for some special mission for God. Think about that. Okay? People that were anointed, remember, kings were anointed, priests were anointed, prophets were anointed, all with oil, as a sign of the Spirit and a sign that they were chosen by God to serve Him. Now, understand that these two olive branches have a threefold prophetic significance. During Zechariah's day, they represented Zerubbabel and Joshua. Okay? Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel was anointed as Israel's ruler, and Joshua was anointed as Israel's high priest. And the immediate scheme of things, these two olive trees represent these two men through whom the Holy Spirit the oil flowed into the temple. It was going to be accomplished by who God provided there. And their offices of king and priest, are, are, we find, are both united and fulfilled in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were channels of God's Spirit and His power to complete the rebuilding of the temple. God's Spirit still seeks people through which His power can flow to accomplish His purposes. Presently, uh, these two anointed ones 
would refer to the, the church comprised of kings and priests. Who are going to be kings and priests? We are as believers. According to Revelation 1, look, look at Revelation 1 6. <clears throat> you, you can let Zechariah go. We're done, we're done with it for this evening. Revelation 1 and verse number 6. Um, and the, the Apostle John writes here, uh, and let's back up to verse number, uh, verse number uh, 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, uh, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Uh, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of, of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us, the ones he's washed, amen, his kings and priests unto God and his Father, to, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So, Presently, we could say that these two anointed ones refer to us, the church, the comprise of kings and priests who are indwelt by the Spirit and to be conduits of His Spirit. But there's also a future aspect. Look at uh, Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 3 and 4. In the future, they point to the two witnesses of Revel Revelation 11, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> um. Look at verse 3. He says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These, notice this, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So through the Bible, the Holy Spirit works through people. Amen. He does. He works through people. People who stand with the Lord of the whole earth, who are filled with His Spirit, who are not only willing but eager to do God's work in this world. You don't have to be a preacher. Uh, you don't have to be perfect or sinless. All you have to do is be filled with the Spirit and eager to do God's will wherever you are. And the Holy Spirit is still looking for people through which God's power can be demonstrated to this world. He's looking for young or old, single or married, rich or poor, man or woman. He can use anybody. Will you let him use you? That's the question. Amen? The question is, will you be a person who is fully and wholly consecrated to God? And with that, we, we end chapter number 4. And uh, I trust that... Uh, you can see the importance of God's Spirit in uh, doing the work of God in your own life. If you're saved, you're indwelt. You're indwelt, but are you filled? In order for, in order for uh, you to channel properly what the Spirit of God would have you to, to bring forth, you've got to be filled with the Spirit. So let's make sure you're saved and filled with the Spirit and let God do a work through you. Let's pray. Father.